Hi, today we'll talk about the nervous system and why you can move your hand when you want to move your hand. So the nervous system is basically divided into two parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The first one is basically your brain and the spinal cord and the second one is well, nerves and ganglia. Today we'll focus on the central nervous system. We can distinguish white matter and gray matter in the central nervous system. White matter is made of axons or tracks and it's called white because the axons are surrounded by myelin. It's a white fatty substance. The function of white matter is to connect different parts of the brain. You can think about this as some kind of wiring in your brain. Gray matter on the other hand is made of the cell body. So the place of the cell where you have all the nucleus and organelles and a bunch of stuff. It's called gray because it's darker, like it's denser, the nucleus is denser than the axon and there is no myelin, so it's just darker. The function of gray matter is to control. You can think about it as a bunch of controlling centers that control movements, sensation, reflexes. Everything that you can think of is being controlled and interpreted by the gray matter. That's also the place where your thinking and emotions are processed. Most of the great matter is in your cortex, so the outermost part of your brain. It's divided into three different types of areas. The first one is the motor area, so it's active when you, you know, bench press or lift or even speak. Any type of control over muscles is taking place in the motor area. The second type of areas are sensor areas. They're responsible for receiving information about well, senses, so light, temperature, sound. They're active even right now as you're watching this video because your brain constantly receives information from your eyes about the light coming into them and from your ears about the sound coming to you. The third type of areas are association areas. They're responsible for combining and understanding the information from all different parts. So, for example, when I say orange juice or you read orange juice, well, you can imagine it, you can kind of recall the taste of it, even smell of it. You basically understand what does it mean. Now let's take a look at some specific areas of the brain and what happens if they get damaged, for example in a stroke or, I don't know, in a car accident. Broca's area is located in the motor area and it's responsible for muscle movement during speech. So, for example, the movement of your tongue. Let's say your Broca's area gets damaged because, I don't know, you had an accident. Now you can't really control your tongue that well. Most likely you're able to say just simple words or short phrases. Your speech is basically non-fluent, so instead of saying I love orange juice, you would say something like I... I... orange juice. So you have lots of gaps, lots of waiting, and you might omit some of the words. However, the rest of your brain is fine, so you can understand others, you can understand yourself. It's just a matter of, well, you cannot say anything fluently. That's why this condition is called non-fluent aphasia or Broca's aphasia. Wernicke's area is also responsible for speech, but in a different sense. Well, it's located in an association area and it's responsible for comprehension and understanding of language. Let's say your Wernicke's area is damaged because, again, you had an accident. Now, because the rest of your brain is fine, you can speak fluently. However, you don't really understand what's going on. You don't understand the speech, uh, both others and your own. So for example, instead of saying, I love oranges, you might say like, I, them, their, apple, go, car, I. You can't understand anything out of this, right? Yet your random words are fluent. That's why it's called fluent aphasia or Wernicke's aphasia. If you look a bit deeper to your brain, you can say diencephalon. This part consists of two main parts. Thalamus and hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is responsible for the autonomic nervous system and controls stuff like hormones or body temperature and other biological rhythms. Thalamus, on the other hand, is kind of connection between the spinal cord and the cortex. Below both of the structures, there is a brain stem. It's made of three parts, midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. This part of your brain controls basic stuff like circulation, respiration, or the most basic reflexes in your body like the pupillary light reflex. If this part of the brain gets severely damaged, well, you're dead. Like, right away. Very deadly. Lastly, we'll talk about the cerebellum. This part of the brain is responsible for skeletal muscle coordination. So cerebellum enables you to do more complex movements like walking, dancing, jumping, all those movements that require multiple muscles working together. Cerebellum activated, balance detected. When this part of the brain gets damaged, you lose your coordination. That's what basically happens when you have too much alcohol. Well, it's difficult to keep balance because your cerebellum is intoxicated. Now let's talk about the spinal cord. It basically connects your brain with the lower parts of your body. 
it can also control some reflexes. Okay, but how is it possible? How does your information from your hand goes to your brain? Well, let's explain. First, you need the stimulus. In my example, I use high temperature. So let's say, for example, you like candles and you have a candle and you put your finger just above it. The information about it will be recorded and passed to the spinal cord by the first order neuron. The first order neuron goes from your finger directly to your spinal cord. To do so, it first goes to the dorsal root ganglion, where it has its cell body. From there, it goes to the dorsal root and to the dorsal horn. Yay, we have arrived in the spinal cord. So one more time, from finger to your dorsal root ganglion, to your dorsal root, to your dorsal horn. By the way, dorsal means to the back of your body. Now the first order neuron connects to the second order neuron by a synapse. Now the second order neuron goes up to your brain through a tract or basically bunch of axons. In the brain, it reaches thalamus. Well, yeah, we are in the brain. What's now? Here in the thalamus, the second order neuron connects to the third order neuron by synapse. From there, the third order neuron goes to the cortex, to the somatory area. And yeah, that's it. Your consciousness is aware of the temperature. Like, I know it's hot. Okay, cool. Now let's say it's getting too hot in here and you want to move your finger away. What happens? The information about the movement starts in the motor area in the cortex. From there, it is passed down to the spinal cord by the upper motor neuron. Once it reaches the height of your arm, the upper motor neuron connects with the lower motor neuron in the ventral horn. From there, the lower motor neuron gets out of the spinal cord by the ventral root. From the ventral root, the information goes directly to the muscle and, well, you move the muscle. That's it. Of course, all of this takes time for your brain to process. That's why, in the case of an emergency, let's say, well, you burn your finger and you feel pain, the brain might be omitted. The information about the pain comes from the first order neuron to an interneuron in your spinal cord. From there, a signal is sent directly to your muscles through the motor neuron. This is called the reflex arc, but that's a story for another time. That's it for today. Subscribe if you want more bio content like that. And if you want to learn why you don't overheat when your hot crash walks into the room, click here. Click it, click it, click, 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 click. Cerebellum activated. Yaskuka performed.